singing along and participating. Uh, I just heard something that I didn't know to announce earlier, but a couple of weeks ago, Lois's great grandson, 10 years old, drank. Oh. What he's what? This week. This week. Oh, okay. He drowned. And is that local or? Yeah. Okay. My granddaughter lives here. Okay. Oh wow. He was kayaking. He was kayaking with his grandfather. He was kayaking with his grandparents. Grandfather on the pay On the pay Ah. So sorry. Mm. Okay, uh, we're going to be in Ephesians 5, verses 3 through 5 this morning. So if you want to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians 5, we'll start with verse 3. If you don't have your Bible, I'm sure Mike's going to have it on the screen. Ephesians chapter 5, beginning with verse 3. Paul writes here under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, and he says, But immorality or any impurity or greed must not even be named among you as is proper among saints. We closed our study last week with Paul telling us that we are to be imitators of God. And he, he told us that there were four ways that we were to be imitators of God. First, in forgiveness of others. Second, in love for others. Third, offering our lives to be lived in obedience to God and service to our fellow man. Fourth, offering our lives to be living and holy sacrifices no longer conformed to this world. And then we saw that in so doing, we would be more like Jesus, who was a fragrant aroma to God. Now, in these verses today, uh, Paul makes it clear the kind of life that believers are to live by pointing out three areas of sin that should not be named, he says, among saints. Now, let's talk just a second about that word saints. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church uh, ever so often names people who've been dead a long time. They, they reached a certain standard of qualification or whatever and they are then labeled as saints uh, but that's really not scriptural that's a tradition that they have the Bible refers to all believers as saints and the word actually means holy ones okay <clears throat> now we see that uh, Paul makes no point here uh, or makes the point here uh, of what believers are to be and how we're to live. He draws no distinction here between different believers, but he names all believers as saints. The NIV uses the phrase as God's holy people. Okay? <clears throat> so this is, this is what we're dealing with here. and This is uh, what we're talking about, that these sins are not proper among the saints or among the Christians. Now, uh, Paul points out that there are three areas of sin that he names that must not be named among Christians. I like the way the NIV puts that verse. It says, but among you there must not be even a hint of these sins that are listed here. Now, let's look at the three sins. Number one, immorality. This is the Greek word pornea, and you can in your mind clearly see that this is uh, uh, one of the sources of the ways we get our word uh, pornography, pornea. Uh, it's translated in, in the uh, English as fornication. Now, most often we think the word fornication in the Bible refers to sex before marriage. And there are places that it does that, but here it is referring to immorality, and sexual perversion of, uh, of uh, almost every kind really is included. And that's according to the Tyndale commentary on Ephesians. It's not just 
here referring to sex before marriage, but it's referring to all immoral sexual activity. It's uh, all that works against the one man and one woman sanctity of the marriage. Just, just whatever is working against that, it comes under this word here in fornication. And we can see that even the definition here of the, this Greek word uh, would bear witness against same-sex marriage as an example. <laughs> because that's what it's saying it, is if it goes beyond, if it breaks this intended thing of God of one man and one woman to be married to each other for life or as long as they both uh, live, uh, if it breaks that sanctity of marriage, then it's this word fornication here as it's used, whatever that sin might be. Uh, so here we see uh, that, that this is a pretty straightforward statement that would go against a lot of, uh, of sin then outside of marriage. Second is the word impurity. Now this Greek word can be translated as uncleanness or lewdness. So this would refer to indecent, lustful, uh, unchaste sexual behavior. Okay? And the third is greed. Uh, this Greek word is translated also sometimes as covetousness. Okay? Uh, but it is being put forth here as, as greed. And, um, and, and when a person has greed or is greedy, the scripture is clear that it, that makes them what? Do you know? Idolatry. Say it louder. Idolatry. An idolater. Yes. When a, when a person is greedy then or covetous, then the Bible says they are then idolaters. That is a, the practice of idolatry. Now, Martin points out that this word usually refers to a possessive spirit which is the trait of a man who wants to acquire great material wealth. And that's the way we normally use that verse. Okay? In terms of someone that's greedy and covetous. They just can't get enough. They just want more and more. And uh, that's the way the word is, is normally used. But here in this context uh it is, it is used here then to imply sexual immoral excess that is produced when men live their lives for gratification of their sexual appetite and it becomes an idolater, an idol to them and they become idolaters not in the sense of worshiping money or material things but in the sense of being worshipers of immoral sexual indulgence. Now, a perfect example of this, I believe, is before us in the media today. Uh, and it's the example of the life of uh, Jeffrey Epstein. His life was a life of extreme sexual indulgence. That was an idol to him, I think we could say. I think he was, he was, he was idolatrous of that from what little that we know about him. And uh, then you have those people that are high-ranking, well-known people from around the world that are probably, and I underline probably, okay, don't know this yet, but could probably be coming in under the same uh, banner or whatever as, as Epstein. And so we see that this uh, is, is just immorality taken to the extreme. And, uh, and that's what we see uh, in, in Jeffrey Epstein's life and, and the life of those that, that are or could be involved in him. Now, my mouth is dry. <laughs> <laughs> Janice believes in this stuff so much, I got a bottle at home and a bottle here. <laughs> Thank you, Janice. <clears throat> but, uh, you see what we're talking about here in terms of, of these words and, uh, and what they mean. Uh, so, let's go on now to verse 4. Everybody's familiar with who I'm talking about when I say Jeffrey Epstein. Anybody not know? Uh, 
it's uh, that's something that's going to get more interesting as as it's probed in to further. Uh, there are just too many things that they already know about his situation of hanging himself that is just <laughs> that would not be happening in any prison. No way. It's just not going to happen. So it, it's going to be interesting. Now, verse 4. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting which are not fitting but rather giving of thanks. So, <clears throat> Placer. Yes. Somebody say something. Help me. There it is. <clears throat> Here Paul points out three other areas of sin that should not be part of a believer's life. The first is the word filthiness. And what this word means in the Greek, it means baseness or indecency. Okay? It goes beyond filthy speech and includes a morally low, obscene, disgraceful lifestyle. Okay? So you can imagine some of the activities that people would involve themselves in that would come under this category. The second is silly talk. This is an interesting word. In the Greek, it refers to foolish talk like that of a drunk man. Okay? That's, that's what the word is meaning here. It, it's, it's without sense and without profit, according to pool talk. And certainly, a lot of things that drunk men and women say are senseless and without profit. And so that's a good way to understand what he's saying here in this word silly talk. Now the third, he says, <clears throat> that Christians should not be uh, dabbling in is coarse jesting. The word can refer to <clears throat> something like good-natured ridicule or teasing. It can refer to that. It may refer to a witty reply. But it goes beyond that here in what is being meant in this context. In this context, it indicates that which is not convenient for the Christian. Probably Paul was thinking of the lightness, listen to this carefully, of witty talk that plays too often on the borderline of improper words for a Christian, according to Robinson. So we're not talking about just the little witty back and forth that someone would have with someone. We know that some people are we, what we call witty. They're quick with a joke or quick with a word, uh, you know, uh, about something. So they're quick with something like that. And there's, this is connected, but it goes further, okay? It goes beyond that which is acceptable and nice to being witty and all in, in words and subjects that are improper for Christians to be being witty about, okay? Does that make sense? Okay, <clears throat> thus Paul is saying, there must be no shameful conduct, no foolish talk, or coarse joking in the Christian life. For these things are not fitting, proper, or uh, becoming in the Christian's life. Instead, Paul says, there must be giving of things. Now, I like the definition that the Greek analytical uh, <clears throat> Uh, analytical Greek lexicon gives. Listen to this carefully as to what it means here in this, uh, in this uh, place in, in uh, the Greek to be thankful and to give thanks. It's conversation. It's still connected with conversation. Conversation marked by the gentle cheerfulness of a grateful heart. Isn't that beautiful? Conversation marked by the gentle cheerfulness of a grateful heart as in contrast with unseemly mirth. In contrast to unseemly mirth. Okay? Incredible description. He just lays it out there exactly what we can understand, what Paul is saying that we're not to be doing uh, as, as Christians. Thus, the believer is not to be guilty then of living a life that can be characterized as morally low, 
obscene or disgraceful. The Christian uh, uh, is not, or their speech is not to be characterized as silly, without sense, or without profit. And finally, the Christian life is not to be characterized by coarse joking, which is most often on the borderline of improper words for a believer to speak. Instead, we should be speaking words that are gentle and cheerful and, have, and of a great heart. Okay? And, uh, and so this should be characteristic of us as Christians. And uh, we don't all live up to the standard, as I, I can say for myself and, and, and all of us. But it's a beautiful goal and standard that we need to move toward. Uh, and, and, and what the scripture tells us when we see something that we realize, well, I'm not doing that too well, you know. It, it's not a condemnation and a judgment. It's, a, it's an opportunity for us to uh, let the Spirit uh, move into that place and begin to do for us what we can't do ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and then, uh, hopefully that in, in time uh, we can recognize, okay, I'm walking in this type of uh, spirit now and uh, when we do that that is very pleasing to God and it has a great impact on the people around us uh, like like Arnold has said often times I've, I've, I've heard him make a comment about the fact that uh, somebody is watching you if you're a Christian you know? and there may be more than one somebody they're listening to everything you say. They're watching everything you do. I remember when I got out of the Navy and was trying to get my life going in the direction of, of uh, uh, living for God, uh, I had a class with this guy and I'd made a big deal about the fact that you know I'd been in the Navy and I'd been living this way and that way and doing this and, and shouldn't have been doing those things and I'm sorry and now I'm trying to live a Christian life and you know I was really what I was trying to do I wasn't trying to build myself up I was just trying to witness to him well at that point in time I had for a few weeks overcome smoking I'd overcome the drinking and I for a while overcome the smoking and uh, and one day I just couldn't stand it anymore. And I went to a cigarette machine and I dropped him in to get me a pack of Marlboros. And he walked up behind me and he said, I thought you quit all that stuff. <laughs> I, I thought you said you were a strong Christian now. <laughs> oh man, I, just, I was nailed. But I mean, that's what I'm saying. Somebody is watching you, okay? Uh, and. Uh, and then, boy, he was making Christianity strict there. <laughs> I don't know what I did with the cigarettes. I probably just never pulled them out of the bin. <laughs> but anyway, you get what I'm talking about here. Okay. Now, I want you to really listen carefully to this verse 5. Uh, do not jump to any judgment until I close the sermon. Okay, on verse 5. This is a difficult verse of Scripture. It says, For this we know with certainty, that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an entrance, an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. You see, it's taking the sins that we just talked about and it's saying people who do that are not going to heaven. That's a hard verse. <clears throat> and God help us to understand it right, okay? <clears throat> In verse 5, Paul lists three sins that we've already talked about, uh, gave instruction about, and makes it clear that uh, those who live such a lifestyle will not inherit the kingdom of Christ and God. So clearly Paul is saying, with certainty, no sexually immoral person, no sexually impure person, and no person who is greedy uh, to the gratification, being greedy in gratification of their immoral sexual appetite 
and no one who is a worshiper of immoral sexual indulgence will enter the kingdom of Christ and God. He's saying that people who commit those sins will not go to heaven. Now, <clears throat> that's a rough verse of scripture. <clears throat> and I believe we can only understand it when we go to 1 John chapter 3. And I want to read verses 4 through 9. I want you to just listen to these verses. <clears throat> Think about them in the context of what has just been said. This sin, this sin, this sin, if you commit them, you're not going to heaven. Now, first of all, first of all, let's, let's bring something to our minds that is very true that we should understand. Sin is sin before God. Okay? Our sins in society can be seen as bigger. Some of them are bigger than others. Because of the society we live in, you kill somebody, that's bigger. You tell a lie, that's a sin, but it's smaller in society. You understand what I'm saying? So, here we have three areas of sin that is just saying those are going to hell. Well, if as James says, you commit one, you're guilty of committing them all, then how can these three just be labeled as you commit those, it's done, finished, you're toast. See what I'm saying? So that, that's something to think about as we look at this. But at the same time, let's think about, try some of this too. <laughs> Sorry, my mouth and lips get so dry. I don't know why that is. Uh, <clears throat> listen to these verses from 1 John 3. For everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. Now listen carefully for the word practice. Okay? You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. Is there anyone here that knows Jesus? Yep. But you have recently sinned? So what is this verse saying? No one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or known Him. Little children, make sure no one deceives you. The one who practices righteousness is righteous just as He is righteous. The one who practices sin is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. The Son of God appeared for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. Now, he goes on and says, no one who is born of God practices sin because he, his seed abides in him and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, that's as, that's as hard as the verses that we just read that said if you commit this sin, this sin, and this sin, you're, you're going to hell. So we've got to have some understanding. The Spirit's got to give us some understanding here. Because if, if this were to be taken exactly as these two verses, verse 5 and these, these verses I, I just read here, if they're to be taken exactly as it seems that they're being said there, that is saying that every one of us who thinks we're Christians, we're deceived and we're going to hell. Right? Because they're just saying sin. Here, it's making all of it sin. Not just those other sins that we looked at a few minutes ago in verse 5. So, I believe what we have to understand is this, in this, is the key word is practice. That's the key word here. And it even refers in the context to sin when it doesn't even say practice sin. The sin is in this these verses in, in uh, 1 John is talking about the practicing of sin, whatever sin that is. 
Now, what does that mean? It simply means and refers to a lifestyle that is continually lived in sin. It is practiced throughout that person's life all the way through to death. There has been no encounter with Jesus that has ever altered any of that, disrupted any of that, <clears throat> cut out any of that practicing of sin. And so, you look at a Christian then, and what do we have? We have a person who is a sinner and probably has been practicing sin. And now you become <clears throat> cleansed and forgiven by the blood of Jesus. What happens? <clears throat> if we've truly been saved, <clears throat> there's going to be a change in our life. But it's not going to happen instantly in every aspect of our life. There are sins that a young Christian are committing that are sins. And God has shown them that sin. And they're seeking to work to, to the point that they don't commit that sin any longer. But as I've said many times, when they get that one taken care of, there's another one. That they have been living without any concern because they, they had not been made aware it was sin. So you see what I'm trying to say here? And I think this is what the Scripture is trying to say. There's a difference between the practicing throughout a lifestyle of sin as over against the, the, the one that gets born again and they become a new creation in Christ. And the Spirit of God is seeking to discipline and chasten and, and do all the things that God will do to a, a child of His because He loves us. <clears throat> to show us, this is not for you. This is not right. You tell a, a child, don't put your hand on that stove. It's going to burn you. It's going to hurt you. What does a child do? <laughs> exactly. When the Bible tells us, don't do this, this is going to hurt you. What do we do? <laughs> If your mother and your father said, don't do this, it, you know, Belita followed that. And I mean that in great respect. She did. She honored her mother and father. I mean, she honored her mother and father in things that she had not even heard them say, but that she thought that they would think and say. And me? <laughs> I didn't honor my mother and father. And I'm not saying that in a proud way. But I'm simply saying that, that um, you know, there's sin in our lives. And as Christians, I know we're all working to stop areas of sin. And so we, we're not seen in that way then as practicing sin. And I think that's why that that we go to the verses that we just looked at and uh, in, in verse 5 and, uh, and we look at it with a little bit different light. Uh, let me read that again and we will close. But for this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Simply saying that, that those people who are continuing in those areas of sin, they have not yet met Jesus. They've not yet had their sin dealt with. Now, is that to say that every Christian who has met Jesus and has their sin dealt with will never commit one of those sins? No, it's not. It's not. Unfortunately, Christians have and do. And as long as Christians are on this earth, there will be areas in which that believer is seeking to overcome an area of sin. And I think every, every single one of us sitting here can identify with that. Every one of us can think right now and, and, and your mind can fall on a certain 
sin or area in your life that you realize, I don't want to continue to do this, God. I get upset every time I do it. And I'm trying not to do it. Will you please help me? Forgive me and help me to quit this. And so we've all gone through that process. And we've all had those things we've struggled with. And we've had those things we've been successful in. And those things are behind us now. But there's just another that's there to say, here's your next thing to work on. And um, so I, I'm hoping that with all that's been said this morning, with all that's, that's going around and stirring around, that, that you realize these were my next verses. I had to teach them. They were not taught to bring any condemnation on any person for any reason or anything. Um, but they're serious and we need to take them seriously. Even though all this is true, it doesn't give us a right to just say, well, you know, I'll work on that later. I'm going to go on and do it and enjoy it now. That, that's, you know, we, we can't have that attitude. We, we, need to, we need to be serious about it. So I close, uh, as I've been doing lately, with questions. Number one, have you truly accepted Christ as your personal Lord and Savior? If you have not, then uh, you can practice sin and it doesn't bother you. That's a good definition. If you can practice sin and it doesn't bother you, you're lost. You need Jesus. But if you're practicing sin and it bothers you, then you're saved. Or God is working to bring you to salvation. You know what I mean? I mean, He's showing you in, in all. So, second, as a born-again believer, have you been water baptized as a profession of faith in Jesus Christ? If you've not, you need to be. I'd love to talk to you about that. We're having a baptismal service next Sunday. It'd be the perfect time for you to jump in on that. Now, are you living a life of sexual immorality, sexual impurity, and greedy desire for immoral sexual indulgence? If so, then as a Christian, you need to be getting, and I'm sure you are, seeking that but the power of the Holy Spirit to overcome in those areas. You need to be sad and broken hearted over the committing of sins in those areas. It, it needs to weigh heavy on your Christian life until you're, you're able to come to the place as a Christian to recommit your life to Christ and move away from that or as a lost person to recognize all of this is sin. And, and without Jesus, it's going to send me to hell. And, and if you're recognizing that, then you need to come to Jesus. And finally, are you living a morally low, sinful lifestyle? Do you speak words that are without sense or profit? Do you practice coarse joking that involves words and subject, uh, subjects a Christian should not speak. If so, as a Christian, you need to seek to stop that and, and, and do a recommitment of your life to Christ for strength and help by the Spirit to overcome those years. If you're lost and living in that and you've never thought anything bad about it before today, maybe, and you're realizing for the first time, these, these are sins. I'm a sinner. I need Jesus. Then today would be the great day for you to, for you to uh, receive him. Our ministry team will be at the uh, right of the room at the close of the service. If God has spoken to you or is speaking to you in any way concerning the things that we've looked at today, then I encourage you to uh, do what you need to do to move into where God wants you to be. Don't leave here without doing that. And uh, you'll be blessed if you do. Um, I want to thank you today for 
your your kind uh, attention, and um, and let's just go from here. Um, committed to pray uh, for every aspect of what we talked about earlier. Every aspect, everybody involved, and um, and let's just put it in God's hands and, and let Him work it out. Yeah. Word of knowledge. I was thinking she's giving me something real important. <laughs> what did I say? <laughs> you tell me. <laughs> what did I say? Ladies retreat. <laughs> yeah, there you go. I knew you two were a lot alike. <laughs> Yes, she was saying the ladies. Don't forget the ladies meeting right over here. So the ladies that are going on the retreat, you have a meeting right over here to close the service. God bless you. Thank you for being here. You're a great, great bunch of people.